Featured speaker today is Luis Agurto Jr. Many of you may know Luis from your work with him and because he's been a longtime participant of these meetings. Uh, Luis is the city and county of San Francisco citywide IPM contract administrator, and he is a second generation US citizen and pest control operator and is the principal of his family's owned and operated San Francisco local business, Pest Tech. He is an associate certified entomologist, a DPR Healthy Schools Act structural IPM trainer, and has over 20 years of experience practicing and teaching IPM. Luis is an experienced inspector specializing in health related pests. He's a rat and wildlife trapper and evictor, and handy with a staple gun and a hardware cloth. Um, <laughs> so Luis's bio, I love it. <laughs> um, today, Luis is going to be discussing the state of rat management in San Francisco, and he'll be reviewing the recent publication by DPRs, the Department of Pesticide Regulations Sustainable Pest Management Work Group. And he'll provide some context from urban rat ecology research and make suggestions on how this committee can help improve rat management in San Francisco and help California achieve its pest management goals. And while Luis is our featured speaker today, since he's going to be talking about DPR's Sustainable Pest Management Roadmap, we're going to first hear a brief overview on this roadmap from Chris Geiger. Uh, Chris was on the work group that helped produce this roadmap, and uh, he used to be the IPM program manager with SF Environment. He's now working as an independent consultant. So I'll pass it over to you, Chris. Thanks, Shobo. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to nice to be on, on the TAC meeting. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to crash the party for 15 minutes and then you'll get the good stuff from Luis. Um, but I do want to give you just a like a broad overview of uh, I think the, the points of interest in the, the state's new pest management roadmap. Um, so um, and. Oh, wow, it works. There's another feature. Can you see my face in the upper left hand corner? Does it work? Yeah, it does. You look good. I never tried this before. <laughs> it's pretty weird. <laughs> OK, um, so uh, I just talk. Um, I'm not even going to go through all of these things here, but I'm going to talk about the key points and uh, you know what, where it came from. And then the, th the big points for me were the inclusion of urban issues and urban data. Uh, attention to prevention and also a prioritization process that Hopefully this roadmap will set up. So I'll tell you more about that in just a second. So this is this was a 21 month process with a, a 25 member uh, stakeholder group and then another eight people in the urban sub subgroup. Um, many, many of you know many of the people on this list. I was the lucky guy who got to be on both groups somehow. Um, and it was kind of grueling, um, I have to say but also really exciting when we were able to come to agreement with such a diverse group of growers and activists and um, uh, chemical company people and uh, you know associations and so forth. So gosh, the time delay on this computer is really extreme. There we go. I'm not going to go through this, but you can look at the website and see all the, the notables who are on that um, group. Um, one of the big exciting things for me is we finally have an emphasis on urban issues. You know that 35 to 55 percent of all pesticide sales in the state of California are for non-agricultural uses, and that's growing. Um, people don't really realize that. You know, it's not just agriculture when you're thinking about pesticides. Um, so. Uh, in the past, this has gotten short shrift. We have gotten short shrift. And now I think we are getting equal time and they're trying to correct that with more support for urban IPM research and um, more targeting of grants for urban issues um, and recommendations to have things like trainings for unlicensed pesticide users who are in key positions. For example, apartment managers. They're uh, they're affecting the indoor air quality for thousands and thousands of people, and yet they are they are pretty much guaranteed to not be trained in pest management or pesticide use, or in contracting for good pest pest management. 
So there are some key areas of, of potential trainings or resources um, that the roadmap is recommending we pay more attention to, including potential license, uh, new license categories. Um, all of these are recommendations. None of it is firmed up or confirmed. You know, this is a this is a document that is supposed to be guideposts, but it's not in place at this point. Um, there would also be more targeted outreach in key areas that, for example, I, I'm going to say veterinarians. Um, there is uh, an issue with some of the uh, flea control products used on pets, the ones that are da you dab on. Believe it or not, that makes it into the surface water and at uh, levels that are uh, can have an effect on uh, aquatic life. And there are safer alternatives that work just as well, but you have to talk to vets to make that happen, right? Uh, so there are a lot of these examples in the urban realm where you have to talk to a bigger group of people than they've been talking to in the past. So urban issues are there, and um, um, and also there is a call for getting more detailed urban data specifically for the pesticide use reporting system. And if you are a pest management professional, you know what I'm talking about. You have to file every month with the Ag Commissioner's Office uh, what pesticides you used. But in urban areas, unlike agriculture, you can't tell where it's used, when, you know, when it's used, what it's used for. And so there's going to be more detail, I think, put into the data requirements for urban. And there are issues about privacy there that they're going to have to deal with, like they, people don't want to reveal their clients to other pest management providers. So it may not be exact locations that they'll put into that database. Um, there will probably, there's a recommendation for like surveys every five years, for example, on urban pesticide use patterns, so that we be better understand what's going on with that. Um, and then th the thing that's really close to my heart is there's a lot of attention to prevention in the roadmap. Um, there is a proposal to formalize pest inspection requirements for structural pest con control professionals in branch two, similar to what's already there for branch three. And that's sort of a first step. But in, in our work with apartments, and Luis, I think, would agree with me, um, realize that just it, it's so important just to have a good inspection, someone who knows what they're doing, checking out these places. And uh, so this is one path, one step on that path. There may be new license categories. There is a recommendation to update building codes to include some of these factors, these these little things you can do in buildings to prevent pests, just plugging up holes, getting rid of hiding places and so forth. Um, and there, is, there are recommendations to promote pest preventive landscape designs. So this is all the stuff we've been doing, right, over the past 10, 20 years, and it's, it's kind of making the big time, it seems like, if things go as we hope they do. Um, and then the third thing I'm excited about is, and don't try to read this, <laughs> is there's a mechanism they're recommending for prioritizing pest management issues statewide, prioritizing pesticide products and pest management issues, uh, forming, a, a, this would involve people who are uh, doing the work, like uh, stakeholders, not just bureaucrats making rules, um, uh, creating priorities and action plans and doing this every three years. So this is totally new. This is not the way things have done, been done in the past. Uh, we have uh, some of this going on with the registration process for pesticides, but it is not tuned in to where the real problems are. So that's the, that's the key to this. We'll see how this fleshes out. Um, uh, they're seeking funding. <laughs> uh, well, this I stole the slide from DPR from the other day, but um, part of that prioritization is identify what they're calling priority pesticides. And um, this is the important one. And the, the criteria they're going to use 
for priority pesticides and priority pest management issues are hazard and risk classifications. You know, does it cause cancer? You know, is it killing fish? Availability of alternatives, which they hardly ever consider in these discussions. And, uh, and also just looking at the situations where these products or these methods are used. So those are that's what's going to feed into that prioritization process. And in turn, that those priorities would be used to guide grants, guide research, guide registration efforts to prioritize soft chemicals. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's meant to be a centerpiece of the future roadmap. So this is my last slide, but what what can we do now? So, you know, Luis is going to talk about a lot of things that might fall into this plan, uh, might be things that we can do under this roadmap, some specific ideas, I think, for things that are needed. Um, and you might get some ideas from his presentation, but uh, comments on the roadmap are due March 13th. Useful comments would be, I think, personally, um, first of all, urging that these things be funded by legislators, especially the things that are your personal favorites. I, I'm the, the items that I just cited are my personal favorites, even though it's very general. I think they need to move ahead with the pest prevention and getting that as part of, for example, building codes and move ahead with getting those inspection requirements. But um, anyway, those comments are due March 13th. The important thing is getting this all funded. That's legislators <laughs> That's and the governor's office. It goes straight into politics. Um, uh, Rebecca bauer can who is uh, the assembly member from the East Bay, already has introduced a bill it's, uh, to get this started. Um, I think it's probably going to be fleshed out a little more, but uh, it's something to watch. Um, and I'll provide the link uh, for all this stuff in the chat after I'm done. Um, but if you want to have a, you really, it's a long, long document. I'd recommend checking it out. Uh, you don't have to read every every word, but it, it's uh, there's a lot of meat there. Um, I'd recommend you check it out. Um, and let's see. Oh, oh yeah. And another thing we can do later is when these work groups and these priorita prioritization stakeholder groups are being set up, just kind of keep in the loop and get involved if you can, because this will affect the way um, you do your job. And uh, the whole purpose of this is to have more realistic options available to pest management professionals and you know both for landscape and structural you know turn it over to Luis. thank you chris i we really needed that and uh it needed to come from you because um i think the document is like really amazing i i really enjoyed reading it and uh, i did it both ways from top to bottom and from bottom to top and i learned something new each time i read it so um i'm not going to go into too much detail about it but i do want to uh, touch some high points as well and then talk about what we know so uh, to prepare for this presentation, uh, I reached out to Neve Quinn. She's the UCIPM uh, vertebrae specialist. And um, I asked her what data would be good for um, talking about rats or for having a better understanding of rats. And she said, go research more. <laughs> Look up these different documents. And uh, you'll see that we really know very little about um, urban rat populations and how they behave. Uh, so I did a little bit of that, and I'll share that with us today. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, uh, Jesus. So um, I stuck with this uh, metaphor of the roadmap for my presentation. I think that, um, you know, I'm really proud to be part of this IPM uh, committee for as long as I have been and uh, working with you all. And I think, you know, despite what the researchers say, we do know a lot about rats. Uh, so I want to start today off by uh, looking backwards. Uh, back in 2019, we had a presentation uh, at this committee on neighborhood scale rat management. 
So I'm going to uh, touch those points um, uh, with that Natter. Uh, he headed that meeting and uh, and uh, Matt Pruitt from Reckon Park uh, represented what they're doing at the parks there. Uh, Nixie, uh, Nikki uh, Mixon uh, with Public Works uh, was also uh, presenting at that meeting. So I'm just going to review what we know and then look back at uh, what's changed since then. So I went back and visited those sites um, yesterday, uh, this week. Uh, then we'll talk about this rat recall, uh, ecology um, from the research that's available. Uh, I'll identify some knowledge gaps that the researchers say that we have or potholes, and then uh, give us some suggestions on how we can fill those potholes. Uh, I really have no idea how much content I have. I tried to edit as much as possible uh, to leave room for discussion. So I was also in conversation with uh, Cree, uh, who I wanted uh, to really help us understand what are the reporting requirements and how will uh, the County Agriculture Commissioner's Office um, you know, fit into this new sustainable pest management uh, regime and the additional uh, data collection reporting that may come from it. So uh, I hope that we can we can discuss this further. Um, next slide. So um, I have pizza rat in uh, my presentation. Every time you see pizza rat, you should know that uh, there's some content here that's going to be on the quiz. So if you're taking that quiz, pay special attention. Next slide. So Chris uh, and Shoba, or Shoba gave me a good introduction. Thank you so much, Shoba. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit more. Um, my father started the company in uh, 1985. Uh, with a desire to make uh, his life and the life of our family better off by creating a better pest management company. So uh, his roots were from agricultural pest management, which is where I think the ladybug came from. But ultimately, I think he was a branding genius. Uh, pest tech and the ladybug. The ladybug is actually an icon for IPM now. But you can imagine in 1985 how foreign that was. Mostly what we thought about the pest control person at that time was uh, you know, maybe the guy with the hammer going to hit the, the rat or a big spider. Uh, and still to this day, you know, know-it-alls will approach me on the street and tell me, hey, you're doing something wrong if you're killing ladybugs. And, uh, and it's a little irritating because it's obvious, right, that uh, ladybugs are a biocontrol. And, uh, and it's really an opportunity for us to be able to explain that to them. Ladybugs are actually beneficial insects. Uh, just like we are beneficial biocontrols working in the community, uh, trying to make it better. Uh, working in IPM for the last 20 years uh, has really been transformative for uh, myself and I think for our company uh, in many ways. Uh, and I think in many ways, uh, you know, besides being a beneficial, we're becoming more pest-like in some cases. Um, you know, and what I mean by that are the, the positive things that pests have, like uh, they're persistent. So you can ask uh, Matt Pruitt and Nick, uh, Nikki Mixon. Uh, I can be persistent and sometimes I have to bug you a little bit so you can engage with me and we can have these conversations uh, even when they're not most pertinent to uh, you know, the things that we're dealing with on a daily basis. Uh, we're adaptable. So uh, the fact that we're no longer in pest control and we're an IPM means that we have to continually adapt, uh, offering new services, investing in new equipment and technologies, and adapting to the constant environmental changes that we have, uh, such as higher costs and uh, challenges in recruiting. And uh, ultimately, uh, like pests and rats in particular, uh, we have to transcend boundaries. So, um, you know, no longer are we just pesticide applicators, but uh, we have to provide uh, services for construction. If pest prevention by design is the future, then uh, I want to be engaged in that. And uh, so we are now uh, licensed contractors uh, with specialty licenses for uh, weatherization uh, because there's a huge overlap between weatherizing buildings and uh, excluding uh, pests from them. Uh, as Shoba said, I'm also the trainer for uh, uh, DPR for structural IPM for schools. And, uh, I'm const and I've been doing that for the last 10 years. And the goal there is to be a better communicator, a better trainer, to reach people where they are. Uh, and to keep it interesting. So uh, I'm, I hope I, this is an interesting com uh, conversation that we can have today, a good presentation. I hope that you learned something. Uh, but uh, just by preparing for this, I learned so much. So again, thank you Shoba for inviting me uh, to do this. It really does push me to, uh, to improve all the time. Next, please. 
So I don't want to spend a lot of time on the uh, sustainable pest management roadmap. I think uh, I just want to present some of the high points or the waypoints that I think are relevant to urban uh, rat management. Uh, reading the document was really deja vu for me. Uh, it seems like California is following the lead that San Francisco has been setting, that the Department of the Environment has been setting, and, uh, and really Chris Geiger's legacy. Um, they're talking about enhancing monitoring and data collection. We've been doing that now in San Francisco for the last 25 years uh, for city and county locations. We know how much pesticide we're using by site. Uh, uh, it was here in San Francisco uh, where we developed uh, the pest prevention by design for structures and landscapes. Uh, these guidelines, uh, I believe, are really helpful tools that uh, codify some common sense um, that we can then put into practice and make common knowledge. Um, at the same time, we've done some advanced research and outreach. So uh, Chris Geiger has uh, reached uh, property managers, uh, builders, architects with those pest prevention by design guidelines, and then working with the DPR uh, Pest Management Alliance uh, has studied, studied the implementation of those guidelines uh, and measured the impacts of them. So uh, there's so much that's happened in San Francisco. I'm very proud to have been a small part of it and, uh, and look forward to where it's going uh, in California. And I, I believe that we can get there. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So like uh, doing an inspection uh, at a property, uh, and I mentioned this already, I think it's always a good idea to approach things from two angles. So I read the document a couple times through from top to bottom. It's pretty lengthy. There's so much in it. Uh, and what really uh, changed my perspective on it was when I started from the bottom up. So reading the appendix, reading the, occlusion, uh, the conclusions, uh, there were some things that really stood out to me. Number one, um, it says, no matter uh, your sphere of influence, please join us in making this bold vision a reality. So I know that I'm a, a small business, um, you know, practitioner of IPM, but I really do believe that um, I can help make this a reality at the local level, working together with all of you uh, to improve pest management in San Francisco uh, and then California. Uh, ultimately, this idea of sustainable pest management uh, is defined as a uh, ecology-based approach that's practical and systemic. I'm here for that. Um, it says to be informed by the concerns and interests of those most affected by pests. That makes sense to me and really speaks to me. It doesn't say that we should be informed by those most vocal or those most connected. It says that we should be informed by those that are most affected. And that means going to those um, constituencies, those segments, uh, getting to where they are and listening to them. Uh, and then it also says we should bridge the gap between experiential and indigenous traditional knowledge and the broad influence on it. So I really do believe that um, I have um, some experiential knowledge that's useful and that could be applied in a bigger scale. I know that my team as well uh, has that information and knowledge and, uh, and that many of you that I work with. So I, I got to meet uh, with Matt and uh, Zach from Rec and Park. They have lots of information to share, lots of things that they put into practice. And uh, I hope, Zach, that you'll, uh, when we get to some of those sections, you'll, you'll share with us uh, that information. Same thing goes with Nikki and of course, Natter, uh, you're an expert in these things. If we could take the things that we've learned over the years in our practice uh, and apply it at scale, I'm sure we could do a better job of um, managing rats in San Francisco and beyond. So my call to action with this whole training is let's work together to fill knowledge gaps uh, and process gaps and coordination gaps. And, uh, and hopefully I can give us some ideas for doing that. Next slide. So to start, let's take a look back in 2019 uh, when we met at the county fair buildings. Uh, this uh, presentation is actually was recorded by us. Uh, you can search neighborhood scale rat management in San Francisco and find it. If you watch the video, which I really do recommend that you do, I think you're going to enjoy it. Um, first of all, just being together and hearing the applause, uh, the laughter, uh, the exchange between the committee and the presenters uh, is something that I think is missed. Uh, and I think that um, you would all really like it. And I, 
I really enjoyed reading it, uh, watching it. Um, Natter opened the presentation that day and told us about the history of uh, rat management in San Francisco, um, about uh, how we had bubonic plague at the turn of the 20th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, and, uh, and then what the repercussions of that were. Uh, at first, it was um, maybe a political backlash, some denial about it. Uh, ultimately, it grew to the point that the governor had to intervene uh, and then grant authority to the San Francisco Department of Public Health to mandate IPM practices. So very common sense source uh, and condition um, removal uh, to uh, really manage these populations in a, um, in a systemic way. So uh, I think that was a, a really uh, eye-opening uh, conversation that we had. Uh, next uh, slide. And, uh, and the Department of Public Health is still at it today. So uh, this was a couple of weeks ago, right? Uh, this is for a navigation uh, center that had uh, problems with rats. And uh, what uh, Nader and uh, his team were doing uh, from environmental health was um, really connecting, uh, going outside the boundaries of uh, the site and its issues to identifying the underlying causes of it. And it was very clear what was driving uh, the rat issue. Uh, next door, we have a dumpster. You can see it in the bottom right picture that it's open on the bottom there. Uh, and so rats are able to get in from the bottom, garbage is able to get out, and that is the source of that Norway rat uh, problem there. Uh, we also know that people were picking through the garbage cans and making a, a, a big mess. So he was able to uh, reach the property owners there, get them to uh, change, and then also helped um, train the people on site uh, to manage the problem directly. There's more that needs to happen. You, of course, are gonna have to continue maintaining um, the, uh, the site to keep the rats from coming back. Uh, we're gonna have to keep watching and monitoring the, the garbage situation there. And then there's some infrastructure changes that need to be uh, fixed as well. So you can see the broken concrete around the tree wells. There is some burrowing that's happening in those tree wells. Uh, very likely uh, rats are excavating under those um, the sidewalk as well. So that's something that needs uh, some investment and some effort uh, to really abate uh, long term. But for now, uh, the situation isn't as it was and, uh, and, and it has improved. And it really did take uh, the effort of environmental health in this situation. Uh, next slide. Uh, at the meeting in 2019, uh, Nick, uh, Nikki Mixon also talked about the uh, issues they were having at UN Plaza. Um, there were uh, a variety of, um, there was really a, chiefly a, a Norway rat problem with burrowing uh, in the landscape. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, Nikki talked about how they were able to abate uh, the burrowing issue by uh, excluding them from the, the landscape. So if you go to the next slide, Jesus. Uh, what they did is they uh, dug up a lot of the decomposed granite that was there. They uh, used a product called Excluder Geocloth uh, to create a barrier to keep the rats from digging in. Uh, and then they put the granite uh, back on top. Or if it didn't have decomposed granite, uh, they put it on top of that. Another interesting point uh, in the presentation was that one side of the site, if you uh, one side of the site didn't have uh, decomposed granite, one site did. They were only digging into the side that uh, didn't have the decomposed granite. So although they did this exclusion work, Public Works, uh, it could be that the decomposed granite alone uh, was actually uh, serving as a prevention. Uh, it would be great to go back and really evaluate how long this has lasted. I tried to do that, but if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see that that area has now been cordoned off uh, for something else going on. Other issues that she talked about was uh, the installation of this uh, wood deck. Uh, I know Natter was involved with uh, this problem. I saw this firsthand as well. Uh, it was pretty rampant. And, uh, and there was a lot of other things that were at play as well. Um, that deck was being uh, managed by, uh, I think it was Hunter's Use Families. Uh, this, the idea of having uh, that deck there was to bring people from the community into the space, to utilize the area, and, uh, and to push away some of the behaviors 
that were happening there that were not so uh, friendly uh, to families and and uh, and people that wanted to use it uh, for positive things. Um, since then, we have uh, the Urban Alchemy Group that has a strong presence in the area. It seems like uh, having you know people and faces and consistent uh, ownership of the space uh, really does change the dynamic, uh, the human dynamic uh, happening at the site. So there's been a lot of things changing in uh, San Francisco. I think uh, this is an example of uh, one for the better. Uh, next slide, please. Matt Pruitt talked about um, how rats um, use the parks. Um, he talked about how uh, rats move through the parks, they use it as a harbor site, that the parks are designed to have landscape, and uh, because of that, the rats move into the landscape. Um, there was a few other things that he mentioned. Um, he said uh, that uh, bef he's noted that uh, whenever there's construction happening uh, at parks that um, rats do get displaced, so they try to implement a, a rat control effort beforehand before construction. Um, later on, we'll see in the uh, literature and the research that this is to be, uh, this is assumed to be true, but there isn't enough scientific validation to prove it. I think, again, from experience, we know when there's demolition, when there's construction, uh, many times rats are being displaced. And so it is uh, a good idea, and, and I would say common sense, uh, to, to do some abatement beforehand. Um, we. Matt specifically showed some uh, issues at uh, Willy Woo Woo Wong uh, Playground, uh, where there was some work there that uh, he contracted Pestec uh, to help with. And so I do have a follow-up uh, image of that. If you go to the next slide. Uh, during the back and forth conversation that we were having, uh, there was a question about the impact of uh, the central subway construction. Um, Matter did uh, do inspections of the area during the construction process. He uh, noted that uh, the steel plates that were used to cover uh, the excavation around the area had signs of rat activity in it. Um, another funny exchange uh, during the meeting uh, was that uh, Natter had said that uh, he had been uh, requested uh, to review the, um, the rat mitigation plan for the construction project. He said it was a very thorough uh, plan that covered a variety of different pests uh, and noted that uh, Pestec was commissioned uh, to write that plan. Uh, the funny part was that the contract uh, failed to specify the plan had to be implemented. So uh, there was a plan, it wasn't implemented, and that was really just a contract shortfall. So I think that was a, a learning lesson that I bring up again because um, it's something that we can easily avoid next time with some uh, very simple contract language. Next. So earlier this week, I went back to uh, Willy Woo Woo Wong Playground. Uh, in 2019, it was totally uh, under construction. You can see what it looked like on the left. And now you have a functional playground uh, that has hardscape with a mix of bouncy substrate for kids to play on. Uh, there's very little uh, landscape in there. There's a few um, planter beds. And uh, I did note that there are um, some rodent management stations in those planter beds. I wasn't able to find any rodent activity uh, on my inspection in the playground itself. So it seems like uh, Rec and Park is doing a great job of managing um, those situations. Um, Zach did tell me, however, that there is still activity that they see uh, at the courts. Uh, and that it seems to be coming from behind uh, buildings where uh, apartment people that live in the apartments there uh, tend to dump trash outside their windows. So if you go to the next slide, you can see what uh, that area looks like. So in 2019, these were tennis courts. Uh, right up against the edge, of, uh, the back edge of the tennis court, there was a significant Norway rat burrowing. At that time, uh, we trapped out those rats. We eventually treated them with a, a giant gas destroyer. These are the, the gas cartridges that you can use to basically a smoke bomb to asphyxiate the rats. Uh, and then we cleaned the space and we uh, sealed it up with concrete. 
If you go to the next slide, you can see how that looks today. Now they're basketball courts. Uh, they were in use, which was great to see, uh, but we do start to see that um, the rats are coming back. So at the very back left corner of the court, pretty much in Spofford Alley at that point, uh, we see where some of that concrete is breaking down right at the junction. In general, that's where you find uh, most of the problems when it comes to pests, where you have two different surfaces meeting up. That's where the breakdown happens. That's where cockroaches move in, or in this case, no worry rats. Uh, in the planter bed in Spofford Alley, uh, there is significant uh, rat burrow that's um, rat burrowing that's happening. We know that um, this little planter box is facing some garbage areas um, behind other buildings. So this is something that uh, we need to continue working on. I don't think that we can, uh, you know, that there is a prevention that's gonna be foolproof forever. No matter what, we'll have to continue doing uh, maintenance in this area. Next slide, please. At the presentation, uh, I shared about some work we did for SFMTA at this West Portal parking lot. Um, the area was overrun with Norway rats as well uh, in this uh, IV landscaped area. Uh, we abated the rats with traps, later on treated the burrows, uh, and then removed uh, the ivy and uh, filled it in with uh, decomposed granite. Uh, at the time, uh, the meeting was full of land, uh, you know, gardeners uh, people that are professional weed control and they called us out immediately and said hey if you didn't do anything about the weeds that ivy is going to come back uh, with a vengeance and it's not going to last and if you go to the next slide you'll see that they were obviously right so uh, the ivy is back uh, i talked with nikki mixon she said that um, dpw is doing work uh, for sfmta in these parking lots uh, it's not as overgrown as it was before. They are mowing it down uh, around the edges, but it is climbing up the wall there. Um, but the good news is there is no burrowing that I could locate uh, on that inspection. So it seems like uh, the decomposed granite um, does prevent or limit uh, no way wrap burrowing. Uh, and that's something that you know we wanna think about and, and perhaps incorporate uh, more widely as we um, change these sites. Okay, so next I'm gonna take you through uh, just the different rat control tactics. If you go to the next slide, Jesus, please. That are available to us in San Francisco. So um, before we do uh, pest prevention, we have to control uh, the population. And uh, that really does mean uh, lethal controls, uh, uh, period. So, um, the Victor Snap Trap continues to be our, um, our primary workhorse. Uh, we use thousands of these every year. Uh, these traps cost about $2 a piece. You can use them, you know, 10 to 20 times, uh, um, 10 to 20 times. Uh, the less that you snap them, the better. So if you are uh, doing a trapping where you're setting out, you know, six times the number of traps uh, for the number of rats that you think you have, uh, you should uh, disarm the trap manually instead of triggering the trigger so that you can reuse the trap. Uh, in terms of uh, baits, we continue to use peanut butter primarily. There is a product called Trapper Jack, uh, macadamia nut bait that you can use. It's a lure and uh, the product works very well and it comes in these little handy um, containers so you don't get so sticky when you're using them. Uh, if you go to the next, please. We use those traps uh, in void spaces, uh, in uh, overhead ceilings when necessary, and when we are trapping in public spaces, uh, in night trapping. So we do some night trapping for Rec and Park. Uh, they do this to help monitor uh, rats that they have around the site and as a response to when they have uh, colonies of rats move in. Um, here we can see uh, four adult rats. Uh, we have uh, eight perhaps juvenile rats, and maybe those are very immature rats. Very likely they're immature rats. Uh, sometimes we do catch mice uh, when we're doing these as well. These all seem to be uh, nori rats. Next slide, please. Um, we can also do uh, trapping for rats inside of uh, rodent management stations. 
uh, rodent management stations uh, can be used as rodent monitors. In this case, we have uh, DTEX rodent uh, bait blocks uh, and a T-Rex trap inside. It looks like uh, perhaps that that's a roof rat that we caught in there. Uh, this, uh, this works as long as you have rats coming in and you're checking them frequently enough. So um, the longest we'd like to let uh, a trapping station go unattended would be about a week. Uh, after that, uh, very likely it's going to start getting uh, gross in this trapping station, uh, which could be a contaminant, create some fly problems, some smells, and then also stop being attractive to rats. So whereas this does work, if you have a high population of rats and they go into the bait station or the rodent management station, uh, it does require uh, more labor because you have to service it more frequently than you would a rodenticide. Next. As I mentioned, uh, for preparation for this uh, presentation, I did um, I have a long conversation with Neve Quinn from UCIPM. Uh, one of the startling things she told me was that live traps are the best way to catch rats. And uh, that hasn't been my experience, but the reality is I haven't tried that much. The reason being, uh, it's hard to put a live trap out in the world without it disappearing. Uh, additionally, you have to euthanize the rat once you catch it. Uh, to euthanize uh, an animal humanely usually calls for uh, carbon uh, dioxide. So you would put it inside of a chamber and um, keep it there long enough until the, the rodent expires uh, because of the higher concentration of carbon dioxide. Uh, however, um, it works apparently. So uh, Neve, uh, she recommends it uh, on our field trip to 33 Goff. Um, the gentleman here from Urban Alchemy was doing his own rat trapping at the site to help get things under control, and uh, and he was catching rats no problem. So uh, that's uh, it's an interesting uh, idea. I'm not sure what the practical use would be at scale in San Francisco, but I think uh, for those situations where you have a very challenging roof rat problem that's uh, difficult to get a handle on, uh, life traps may be uh, something to explore further. Next. I'm, <clears throat> everybody wants to know about the A24 traps. Those are those pneumatic traps that come from New Zealand. Uh, they're fascinating. They sound amazing. I feel like they should work. Uh, we did experiment with these several years ago at uh, Recology. Recology up here 96 is the recycling transfer station uh, where um, recyclable material is uh, brought to the, the site, it's sorted, it's bundled, and it's shipped from there. Uh, they have lots of pressure of rodents. Uh, the rodent pressure comes from the infrastructure of the place. There's lots of places for rats to hide in. It's in an adjacent to a natural area, the bay. Uh, and uh, there's lots of food sources for them to be uh, to exploit. So we've been doing work there for a long time. Uh, most of the work that we do for them now is um, is trapping. So we do a mass trapping program uh, weekly where we continue to catch, you know, tens of rats. It was in the hundreds before. Uh, and we're also using rodenticide and rodent management stations. Uh, our, our goals for the site is not rat eradication. I think it's, it's probably impossible uh, to do that. So our goals have been to, uh, to make DPH happy. So when they have the uh, local enforcement agency comes to the site and does their inspection, uh, the goal is for them not to see rats during the day. Uh, the second goal is to keep rats off the sorting lines. If uh, rats are on the sorting lines and they're startling people, there's a risk of injury. Uh, and then the third one is that for rats not to be um, damaging the infrastructure. So they were, when, before we started, uh, getting into uh, front loaders, chewing up the harness, uh, the cables inside them, and, uh, and we've been able to achieve our goals, those three goals. There are still rats at the site, um, but we, they are below the threshold that we've set for ourselves. We did uh, experiment, as I said, with the pneumatic traps for a period of time. Um, I set up a video camera, a wildlife camera, uh, we had these uh, sandwich board trays that they were anchored inside of with flags on them. Uh, and we did kill some rats. Uh, you could find rats when we do our inspection around um, the trapping station. Not a lot of them. Uh, there were some. When I did this experiment with the wildlife camera, what I saw was we killed a rat right away, the first one. 
And then we would have rats that would come visit, sniff, investigate, but they wouldn't go into the trap anymore. So I can't say why that happens. Um, all I know is it wasn't enough. It was too expensive of a trap, too difficult to maintain, especially in a, a very uh, dusty environment where the baits get, um, they collect dust and they become less attractive to the rodents and, uh, and it wasn't uh, efficacious enough. So we have stopped using them there. Hey, Luis, would you yes. mind uh, saying a little bit about what a pneumatic trap is? We got a question in the chat on it. Yeah, so this, uh, so it, pneumatic in the sense that it's powered by uh, by air. So it's a uh, trap that was designed in New Zealand. Uh, they actually have a lot of great technology coming from New Zealand right now. They have their uh, Predator Free 50 program where they're trying to eliminate all the invasive mammalian predators on the island uh, by the year 2050. They're going to great efforts to develop trapping systems, uh, surveillance systems where people can actually report their catches uh, and they can build heat maps all over the island of what's happening with rats. Uh, this particular trap is called the Good Nature is the brand. Uh, A24 is the uh, name of the trap itself. It's powered by a little CO2 canister. Uh, I would pull it up and show you, but I, I don't have control over the screen. Um, and so it's powered by air. So the way that it works um, is there is a little bait lure on the top of this um, trap. If, I could probably go get one right now. Do I have time to do that? <laughs> uh -huh. Hold on, I'll be right back. Sounds good. We'll get a real life prop. I hope that wasn't too disruptive to do. Okay, so let me just show you. So this is the A24 trap. Uh, it has a little uh, place to put bait right here. And so you put the bait. And uh, the idea with the whole trap is to make it as humane as possible with the least amount of maintenance necessary. So it's powered by, and I don't have the little CO2 canister here, but a little CO2 canister that goes here, something that you would use for charging soda bottles or soda um, seltzer uh, bottles. And the idea is the rat uh, is looking for the bait lure that's inside here. It puts its head in there and it hits this pin uh, that then triggers uh, the uh, compressed air to shoot a piston to the back of the rat's head, killing it instantly and humanely. Uh, all the developments that uh, New Zealand is doing right now are uh, trying to make um, these lethal controls as humane as possible. Uh, so the concept is amazing. It's uh, um, 20. It resets itself 24 times. Uh, it drops the rat out, uh, out of the trap, but we haven't seen it work in practice, at least here. And they are somewhat expensive and there's a risk of people putting their fingers in there and hurting themselves uh, or otherwise uh, stealing the trap. So those have been the limitations with it. Next slide, please. Uh, there are some other uh, new and exciting traps. This is the uh, Victor V-Link. The V-Link is a connected trap. Uh, this is the uh, electrocuting tunnel. Uh, the benefit of this trap is, uh, as you can see in the picture on the right, that uh, rats um, are not as afraid to go inside this trap as they might be into a rodent management station because they're able to see all the way to the other end. Uh, when the rat goes into the uh, station, uh, it, it it's looking for the lure. Uh, if you look on the left-hand picture, uh, that's where the lure, or in this case, it might be peanut butter. The rat goes into it. It's trying to reach that lure and it's touching that metal grate. And that's, uh, allow, that's making the connection for the, uh, for the electrical system to work. Uh, that electrocutes the rat, then the, uh, the trap will notify you that you have a catch. So this is something that we're piloting uh, or we've been actually using for, I would say, a, two years at UCSF in a variety of locations. Uh, it's a solid trap. It works. Um, it's, it actually resolves the problem that you have with uh, trapping in stations that uh, you're only checking traps that uh, actually are active. So the big problem with trapping stations 
uh, is that you spend a lot of time checking things that are um, not active, uh, wasting that labor time that's so expensive. Um, there are a few drawbacks to this uh, system. Uh, number one, it's uh, connectivity. You have to pay for uh, a connection. That could be uh, with a SIM card uh, for like a cellular charge. So there's a cost involved with that. You can use a Wi-Fi hub, uh, but then you're using the internet of the site. And so there's some security issues with that as well. Uh, there is a IoT infrastructure network that you can use in San Francisco. Uh, Rec and Park is using that right now. I think it's called the Helium Network. Uh, and so uh, I, at the end of the, when we have discussion, uh, I invite uh, Zach to share with us his experiences using um, that, net, that connectivity and these different devices that they're using at Rec and Park. The other drawback uh, is that if when you get leaf litter inside the trap, you may get a false reading. So you do have to go and clear it. Um, and they are somewhat expensive. So there is the risk in San Francisco that someone's going to open up the trap, uh, break it, steal it, or otherwise mess it up. And that, and that happens with bait stations. OK, next slide. So there's pizza rat, so pay attention. Uh, there are gas generating devices that we've been using in San Francisco for a few years. Uh, this is the Burrow RX. This was a treatment that we did uh, for wastewater. Uh, um, what am I saying? Wastewater Enterprise. Um, this is a rain garden that was on Mission Street, uh, and it was getting invaded with Norway rats. Uh, we were able to abate the problem using the Burrow RX. Uh, this was, I think, in 2021 or in 2020. Uh, since then, there is a new law that pertains to these gas generating devices. Uh, what's specific to rats is that these devices cannot be used within 65 feet uh, for managing burrowing rodents, uh, 65 feet of a structure, occupied or not. So let me say that again. You cannot, it is not legal to use a gas generating device within 65 feet of a structure, occupied or not, to treat burrowing rodents or rats. So this really does limit uh, the use of this device in much of San Francisco at this point. Next slide. And then we, back in 2019, we talked about a pilot we did using dry ice with a label that we had approved as a EPA exempt material. That label was then revoked. Bell Labs did an emergency uh, registration of this product. This product is still not available to us uh, in California. I, in preparation for this um, presentation, I reached back out to uh, Bell Labs uh, representatives. I uh, tried as best as I could. And what I was able to find is uh, a company needs to become an EPI, um, sorry, EPA pesticide manufacturer to be able to sell this product, uh, but it doesn't seem like that's the only obstacle because that seems pretty simple to deal with. Um, I did reach out to our distributor and I found out that um, to purchase a label so that you can fill the label with dry ice uh, cost about $40 for a 20 pound bag. And this is just the label. Um, and so if you factor that in with the cost of dry ice itself, the cost is somewhere around $75 to treat a rat burrow in just materials. Uh, again, it's not something that you can find uh, or actually use legally at this point. So I think that this is off the shelf and not worth discussing any, any further until something changes there. And maybe this is one of those situations where those high um, priority uh, pesticides and the registration process can be reviewed. Uh, I'm not sure what you think about that, Chris, and I, I'd love to talk more about it. Uh, next slide. So that pretty much leaves us back, uh, back to 20, you know, 16, when we were using the giant gas destroyer for treating wrapperos instead of rodenticide baits. Uh, you can find this video on YouTube, how to use the giant gas destroyer. Uh, we did this at Lake Merritt in Oakland. Uh, basically, these are a smoke bomb. Uh, they cost less than $2 a piece. 
Uh, the benefit of using this um, device is that it generates smoke. So when you put it inside the burrow and you cover the burrow opening, uh, you'll see smoke escaping from other uh, exits or openings, and you can find those and cover them up. Um, there is some flushing action that happens when you use these. Many times, if it's uh, a very full burrow system, uh, you may see rats come out of the system, um, but it does work. Other limitations with the giant gas destroyer is fire. So when you have rats that are burrowing in the crown of a plant, which you do see many times, actually the advertisement for this, um, this meeting had a picture of you know, um, some burrowing rats and grasses, uh, those are at risk for a fire. So um, you'd have to keep a fire extinguisher with you or find an alternative uh, in that instance. Okay, next slide. So, and we've talked about uh, fertility control uh, many times at this committee as well. Um, I do not want to say this product doesn't work. We have done four different pilots. Uh, everyone tells us that rats will eat this stuff. Uh, we've had a problem of getting um, rats to consume uh, contrapest. So the idea is this is a fer fertility control product that should stop the rebound uh, of rat populations. I think in concept, it sounds amazing. I think other people have some different experiences with it. Um, Rec and Park has used this product in the past. They still are using it in some places. So I hope Zach will mention this later on when we open this up for discussion. Um, it's hard to know the impact that it's having on populations, I would expect. Uh, but for us, we have got rats to come inside stations to eat non-toxic bait, uh, but not to be able to not eat this product. So I don't know what we're doing wrong, but um, it's also fairly expensive. Uh, it's a lot of liquid that you have to replace on a monthly basis, regardless of activity or not. Uh, it's messy. And uh, when we do not see rats taking it, we get discouraged and six months of trying is just becomes too much for us to bear. So uh, we really need to give it a shot. I'd be open to trying it again uh, at the right site. Um, and, and there's still interest in this product very much. Okay, so now we're getting into rodenticides. If you go to the next slide, uh, we do have some uh, rodenticides uh, in San Francisco that we can use. Um, the first one uh, on the list there is bromethylin. Bromethylin active ingredient rodenticides are limited to the city sewer system, uh, San Francisco airport in the, uh, in the terminal areas, and for commercial leases, when the Department of Public Health uh, cites a significant public health hazard. Uh, this rodenticide is not an anticoagulant uh, and it is a single feed. So again, bromethylene rodenticides are consider considered a single feed or single dose acute poison. There are some risks uh, involved with um, these active ingredients uh, as there is no antidote. So if you go back in the literature, um, these kinds of acute poisons like bromethylin or colcalciferol that are on our list uh, were, were considered higher risk at the time because there is no antidote and may pose a risk to pets um, if they were to get it to ingest it. So these are products that we uh, veterinarians uh, uh, at sites that we work at like the Academy of Science or the San Francisco Zoo uh, prohibit because of the risk it poses to the living exhibits. Colcalciferol is the other acute uh, rodenticide that's still on the list. It's considered to be less risk of secondary poisoning. So if something were to eat uh, a rat that had ingested this poison, uh, it is less likely to be hurt by it. However, if something were to directly eat the colcalciferol bait, uh, you likely wouldn't see any effects for two to three days. And at that point, there'd be not much you can do to treat the animal. So there, it does pose a direct poisoning risk um, and something to consider. I think that's probably by design. Uh, I think uh, in terms of, you know, the precautionary principle, this is, um, you know, user beware. Uh, the user is the one bearing the risk uh, of any non-intended impacts uh, instead of, um, you know, the general environment. And, uh, and raptors and, and other things that may be eating um, these poison animals. 
So that's something to consider. Um, we also we find that these two products are not readily taken by rodents. Um, brometh I mean, bromethylene in the sewer system, we do see feeding on it. Uh, we do see uh, when we do use this for rat control that they will take bromethylene blocks. Mice seem very uh, reluctant to eat bromethylene, um, and that's not allowed for use inside anyway at this point. Coal calciferol, again, they don't seem to take that product very much. Um, so that really leaves us with diphazanon baits. Diphazanon active ingredient is a multi-feed bait. It's considered to be less risky to secondary poisoning uh, as the rats have to feed multiple times to eventually build up enough toxicity uh, to, uh, to be lethal. Um, there is an antidote for uh, diphazanon, which makes it uh, less risky in, in, in terms of direct poisoning, but there is a real risk of uh, resistance developing by using just this single um, active ingredient. If you go to the next slide. So key points to take from this and to remember that poisons are not species specific and they can bioaccumulate in the food chain. That is why we had these restrictions in San Francisco for so long. And now the rest of California is operating under these restrictions. And uh, by attempting to control rodents through poison baits, we place selective pressure on them to evolve counter mechanisms such as neophobia or resistance. So the industry had moved away from multi-feed baits uh, long ago because of the uh, neophobia uh, situation where rats take some bait, they start to feel ill, and then they never go back to eat that bait again. Uh, and as well as resistance. Um, they do develop uh, biological resistance to these, um, these rodenticides. If you go to the next slide, please. In terms of managing uh, rodenticide resistance, uh, it's recommended to do bait rotation. So we do have right now an exemption that was approved uh, for the use of chlorofacinon uh, inside rodent management stations. Uh, that is something that we have started this year, uh, cycling out diphazanon. We're no longer using diphazanon uh, in rodent management stations in San Francisco on the ones that we do have uh, baits in, and we are using chlorofacinon. Uh, at some point, it may be necessary to bring in a different uh, active ingredient and uh, so that we do not develop resistance to this, this other product. Uh, I'm not sure what the frequency of the change should be. I'm not sure how long you would have to stay off the uh, diphazanon active ingredient to reset the population's resistance. Uh, that's something that we'll be looking into further and exploring as time goes on. But uh, I do suspect that we do have uh, diphazanon resistant populations in San Francisco already. Next slide. So I did, uh, as I mentioned a few times uh, in my interview with Neve Quinn, uh, she she told me a few things that I, um, you know, that I think are of note. Uh, number one, she doesn't believe that rodenticides and bait stations actually reduce uh, rodent densities. Uh, in her studies, she found that many rats avoid bait stations altogether. Uh, as well, we don't have an index of rat populations uh, to begin with, so we really don't know how many are being controlled by any management action. And then she also found in her research with Stephen Baldwin, who was a speaker at this committee before, that she found that roof rats uh, were attracted to um, bait blocks, so they would go investigate it and smell it when they were using these in vineyards, uh, but they wouldn't actually eat it. So she's very skeptical altogether of rodenticide, of manufactured rodenticide baits and our use of them in rodent management stations. And um, we know that um, a single approach is never going to work. Um, and I think so far the research is saying it's probably not effective to begin with. Next slide. Thank you, do a quick time check for you, Luis. Okay. Um, so if maybe in the next 15-ish minutes, um, we can go through whatever content you want to cover before switching to discussion. Cool. Okay. Thanks. I think we're getting there. So uh, the other tactic that uh, is worth mentioning is detour gel for rats. This is on our reduced risk pesticide list. It's very narrow use would be for uh, deterring uh, roof rats from fence lines. So we've used this product to protect uh, fruit trees 
uh, and to keep rats from climbing along fence lines to uh, cross the backyard. Next slide. So the big question now gets into uh, ecology. What do we know about rat ecology? Uh, this is an excellent uh, website you should look up, the Vancouver Rat Project. Um, here they studied rats uh, in downtown Vancouver over several city blocks, and they wanted to find out um, you know, what disease pathogens rats were carrying, how did they, they behave, uh, and they had seven findings from the, their study. Number one, that urban rat populations have a number of risk, uh, a number of characteristics that have the potential to influence disease risks. The relationship between rats and their environment is complex. Uh, Vancouver rats are infected with a number of different zoonotic pathogens. I think very interesting is our rats can be a sponge soaking up the pathogens present in their environment. Uh, so really the rats are picking up these diseases in the environments that they're in, and then they can become a mixing bowl where they can change those diseases and perhaps make them more uh, pathogenic. And the characteristics of rats and rat populations determines whether or not uh, the rats will carry diseases. So if they're being displaced, if they're fighting with each other over uh, limited resources, uh, can make them more prone to spreading disease. And that, that's the final one, was that disturbing rat colonies could have unpredictable effects on the spread of rat-associated disease. So in their project, they identified um, urban decay as disturbing or changing the environment, as well as construction activities and demolition. And they also point to direct control of rats as disturbing colonies and moving them uh, from one block, city block, to another city block and taking pathogens with them. Next slide. Um, so in the research, uh, Rats About Town, a systemic review of rat movement in urban ecosystems. Um, in this study, they reviewed 37 unique studies examining the movement of Norway and roof rats. The consensus is that there's a general lack of knowledge on, uh, or of information on basic rat ecology. Um, as well, they found that the home range for rats, which for Norway rats is uh, between 100 and 150 feet, and uh, black rats or roof rats about 100 feet, and this changes based on conditions uh, and uh, availability of food and harborage. Uh, we know that it's a smaller home range in urban settings, and, uh, and it's usually limited to a city block. Uh, rat home ranges are irregularly shaped, with individuals moving along narrow pathways connecting harborage and food sources. Next. During times of activity, which is usually uh, two or three hours before sunrise and after sunset, they travel the same pathways. And that landscape features such as roads, waterways, and resource deserts may impede movement of rats throughout cities. So we see that they're not even uh, they're not evenly distributed in a city, and it has to do with the uh, availability of these resources. Next slide. We also know that uh, landscape features such as tree canopy, dense vegetation, fence lines, and sewer pipes support rat movement in their home range. Next slide. And that as long as rat populations have access to food and harborage, they rapidly rebound after interventions. And that rats may change home range and natural movement pattern in response to environmental change and habitat modification. So this review of these studies is really echoing what they found in Vancouver when they trapped and released rats to study their movement. Next slide. In the research paper by Michael Parsons and team, uh, Trends in Urban Rat Ecology, uh, they identified that studying rats in their environment uh, is a wicked problem. And they define a wicked problem as something that has no clear solution, it's socially complex, it involves changing uh, uh, behavioral changes in people, and many times it, it's a problem that exists over uh, organizational boundaries and responsibilities. Uh, these researchers found that 311 data is uh, highly inaccurate uh, as people conflate rats with mice, so you can't count on it. Next slide. And they identified a framework for addressing these wicked problems. They said you should start by um, identifying uh, the problem and what it is. Um, you have to identify all the stakeholders 
the economic and social costs for each entity and propose tangible incentives at each level and then initiate a collaboration. So to study uh, rat ecology, you have to reach the landowners that control uh, or that are responsible for managing their rats. You have to work with the local public health department to allow them to have rats and not cite them if you're studying them for uh, a, a few month period. And then you have to work with the pest controllers uh, to uh, pause their actions when they're studying these rats. They can so they can actually see what their behaviors are. Next slide. So what are the knowledge gaps? Um, in the research and what these uh, different research um, presentations show is that uh, we aren't sure why rats disperse. When they do disperse, we're not sure uh, how, what the distance of dispersal is. They call that the kernel. Um, they do believe that uh, demolition and construction uh, affects rat movement, but not exactly sure how. Um, they <clears throat> We're not sure on what information can be used to inform innovative pest control technologies. Uh, we're not clear on how rats make decisions, what factors drive their social structure and conflict, and what multimodal techniques can be used to increase trappability and monitoring of rodents. Next slide. So how do we fill these potholes? That's the big question. And the potholes are the knowledge gaps. Uh, obviously, we need to gather data. Um, Michael Parsons and their team said that three in one data isn't accurate. Uh, we also know that there isn't a lot of data there. So when we have looked in it, there's very limited uh, numbers of um, reports to 311. Maybe it's because those go to the Department of Public Health. But the question is, are the people that are directly affected most by these pest problems actually reporting uh, these issues? To study that question, uh, we established an internship program uh, last year with U, uh, University of San Francisco. We had an intern that was um, Chinese speaking um, and she uh, did a survey for us to some 30 businesses in Chinatown and directly asking people uh, if they saw rats uh, and if they did, do they report the rats and uh, do they want help controlling the rats? And the answers were yes, they see rats, no, they don't report rats, and, uh, and they do want help in controlling them. Uh, the follow-up question is to why they aren't reporting the rats, and it's because they don't want to get their neighbors in trouble. They know exactly where the rats come from, many times the back of restaurants or in, uh, supermarkets, and uh, they are community members that aren't trying to, you know, make ish problems for other people. But they were willing to give us this information uh, when we asked them uh, in their native language and we gave them uh, many times a gift. So we had some pencils and the idea of the pencils is to show people, you know, the size of openings uh, that it takes for a mouse to get into their space. Uh, and they really opened up and, and were freely giving us this information uh, when, we, when we met them where they were. Next slide. So we can fill potholes, these knowledge gaps with structured data as well. So Michael Parsons and his team said, hey, rat catch logs would be indispensable for researchers, considering that they're coming from pest management professionals that are trained and licensed, uh, and that could help show where there's activity uh, in an urban environment. And if we aggregate that data and we visualize it, next slide, we can start uh, seeing uh, where trends and hotspots are. So this is uh, using um, our treatment data and from 2022 uh, in San Francisco to show uh, where we spend a lot of uh, management actions. So these could be uh, trapping uh, or rodenticide treatments uh, where you have the red lines are where we did uh, over 200 uh, uh, actions where you see the orange, it's one to 200 actions. And then the green is where we had uh, less than 100. Uh, so more data would have a better map um, and this could really be useful, I think, for coordinating our activities and improving rat management in San Francisco. Next slide. Yesterday, uh, I got to meet uh, Nikki uh, in the field. We went and looked at a situation in an alleyway uh, where there was reports of rats uh, and the whole ecology is just spelled right there for you to see. You have tree wells in there that have uh, burrowing under the tree well. 
Uh, we know that there's a sewer pipe that runs the length of this alleyway. Um, there's broken concrete with big droppings in the corner there adjacent to the garbage area. And then wherever there's uh, open landscape, there's harborage and wrap burrowing happening. If you go to the next slide. In our data visualization, where we can show sewer pipes, drains, culverts, manholes, tree wells, tree canopy, and the actions that we're taking, you can see how all these things line up. So this green bar um, that's adjacent, that's parallel to O'Farrell Street uh, is where we've done some baiting in the past uh, by direction uh, of Department of Public Health to the sewer system. Uh, these green blobs are the tree canopy and those black lines are the sewer pipes. So you can see all this at play right here uh, when we just visualize the data that we're already collecting from the activities that we're already doing. Next slide. So where are we going and what does this mean? I'm going to go back to uh, the roadmap uh, metaphor. This time this is uh, Mayor Breed's uh, roadmap for downtown San Francisco's future. And I just pulled out the highlights here. Uh, our future should be a clean, safe, and inviting downtown. Uh, we're going to do that by transforming downtown into a leading arts, culture, and nightlife destination. And nightlife means people, and it means activity, and it also means rats. Uh, we're going to enhance public spaces to showcase downtown. That means managing rats. And we're going to invest in transportation connections, which means more people, more trash, and very likely more rats if we are not taking direct approaches to managing them. Uh, very soon, we'll be pilot, uh, piloting our, um, our rat abatement team with uh, these e-bikes. Uh, the idea is to have uh, IoT connected traps that we can service with a light fleet uh, very quickly and get around the city and remove those rat carcasses. Next slide. So I, I'm sure there's plenty of things to talk about as there is, but I just wanted to, uh, you know, prompt the uh, discussion with some different questions. So um, number one, uh, integrated teams. Uh, a big question that I have is how can we better implement prevention into design choices? So recently there was a lot of conversation about these um, new trash cans that are being deployed. Uh, are they rat proof? Uh, what other way can these trash cans serve uh, our rat management efforts. Uh, I can imagine these being a source of monitoring. And if we were using some of these IoT devices that just collect incidents of activity of rats, uh, that could really help us understand population densities in San Francisco. Uh, other questions in terms of integrated tactics are who can service and dispose of rat carcasses? If we are reducing the amount of rodenticides uh, in our urban settings, uh, we will continue needing to do some control for rats. And if that's going to be with uh, trapping devices, uh, how do we um, cover all that labor that's gonna be required? In New Zealand, they're bringing everybody on board to trap rats in their, uh, around their spaces at 33 Goff. Um, they were doing the same there. Can we bring that to scale somehow? And then lastly, uh, what is a pathway to, for better uh, collection of data and reporting? in San Francisco and California, and how can we expand rat population monitoring? And the easy answer for me is that um, the folks in the city and county that are on this committee that are handling rats can really share in this, uh, pot of, uh, this data potluck uh, so we can start uh, aggregating that data to visualize it, um, to predict and, and better coordinate our, our management efforts. Okay, so with that, I think we can open the discussion.